Well, it's lovely to speak to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much indeed for your time. It's, cool. it's called A Night With Aggers. Is a night long enough? <laughs> <laughs> well, probably not, actually. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And I've done these shows before with, with other people, obviously, Jeffrey Boycott, I suppose, most famous, but Phil Tufnell and, and David Lloyd. And it's great fun being a sort of a two-man show. Um, but so why not do it by yourself? Go and give it a go. So I'm a little bit anxious about it because when you've got your mate out there on stage with you, it's easy, isn't it? And you can you bounce off each other and you know where you're going. And particularly with toughers, my job is to try and keep some sort of leash on him yeah, yeah. <laughs> before he goes off in all sorts of weird places. And when you're by yourself, uh, a little more difficult, I think, to, to remember where you're going and so on. So that'll be the biggest challenge, I yeah, think. Yeah. Try and, because radio-wise, I just don't work to a script. I'm not used to working to a script. But I think to be unleashed on people on a stage by yourself, you've got to have at least some idea of where you're going to go. So that's, that's my biggest challenge, I think. And actually, as you say, you're, you're working solo, but from the man that's been used to working in a team for so many years, it'll be a bit alien, possibly. Well, it is. I mean, I like my friends around me, if I'm honest. Even, even Jeffrey Boycott. I mean, at least you've got company. It, it's, it's a bit easier, but I mean, radio-wise, where I'm very lucky is that the team is so different and varied. So although sometimes when I'm commentating, I'm looking straight ahead and I see some movement beside me here. And I'm not sure who, I know they're, I know they're changing, I don't know who's coming in. So you slip a sly look and say, oh, it's Jeffrey, or oh, it's Tuffers, or whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of nice, and they're all different, and you relate with them and react with them and interact with them differently. And that's, I think, what makes Test Match Special such a, such a popular show, because it is a kind of a soap opera, and it is, it is those relationships and the, and the people who are on, I think, that sort of fascinates the listener the most. You know, what did you and Vic Marks get up to last night, uh, two nights ago, they said they're going out together? Well, no, I know it's all kind of, you know, but it is, it is soap opera stuff, really. So much to talk about as far as TMS is concerned, but if we can just start a little bit early, in fact, right almost at the very beginning, at school initially in Norfolk. Yes, Taverham Hall. I've still never really worked out why my parents sent me there, <laughs> because oh, it's a beautiful school, and I do go back, and I've been back there. It's a lovely place, a handsome building, there's wonderful grounds, but it was quite a long way from home. And so, I mean, I was brought up at Stamford, basically. So these days, you think A47, nice and easy. Those days, we're talking late 60s, um, it was a bit of a trek, and my dad was a farmer who didn't get out much. He just sat on his tractor. And so I remember the, the build-up and the tension and the pressure of, of being sent away to, to Norwich for so long, you know. And then there'd be perhaps a little bit of a light frost, and there'd be a letter or a phone call to school saying, oh, I'm so sorry, but we can't come and take you out this weekend. So, you know, obviously the weather's too bad. You think, well, perhaps have they done this on purpose? <laughs> perhaps they're trying to tell me something. But I loved it there. It got me into cricket. I remember uh, two things. First, up in the woods around this beautiful school, and it is, it's a wonderful place, it's outside Norwich, had these woods. And in those days, there wasn't much health and safety. So, used to, as these young boys used to go out there and make these magnificent huts, dig them out, and then just go chopping down trees and build a roof for these huts. You were there with your mates underneath. But of course, the idea was that you had these fights, which usually involved burning the next door hut down. Just set a light so these people <laughs> are inside. <laughs> and they'd run out of this place. Oh I mean, it would never happen yeah, these yeah, days. Yeah. Um, and the other was, was, of course, the winter of discontent when there was all the power cuts yeah. in the early 70s. I remember that. Because, again, because young boys, aged 10, 11, everywhere plunged in the darkness for... Well, candlelight. It, yeah, it was all candles. Yeah. And we lived by candles and no heating or anything. Yeah. So I do remember that. But I had, it was uh, cricket-wise, that really got me going. It's got a magnificent little cricket pitch there. And that's where I really, really thought that I had a chance of being better than average as a cricketer, yeah. so I'd always look back very fondly at it. Always a bowler at that stage? Yes, I was. I, mean, I, I was, I was, I was a, um, a, a cowardly batsman. Even then, unfortunately, <laughs> I never really liked the fast facing the fast bowling very much. And although 13-year-olds didn't bowl that quickly, although I mean, for my age, I was quite quick, so I was a bit of a bully. And I, would, um, I could even bowl bouncers at 13, which is quite unusual. Um, I never really liked getting it back myself. I'm honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was uh, that was the early stages that we, we saw you as a, as a cricketer. And what was the? You, you mentioned there you were a bit of a bully at that stage was on the cricket pitch. But what, what was the young Aggers like? Oh, quite musical. Uh, and again, Tavram uh, had a, a, a music teacher called David Price, who was a, who was a great enthusiast, lovely man, and he always put on some big production. Um, you have the usual sort of Gilbert and Sullivan's and, and so on. The HMS Pinafore, I remember standing there on the school stage. I think I was, yes, I was, I was Ray Frackstraw. Um, yeah. but, but music was very important to Tabram. And you know, the choir, we went sang at Ely Cathedral, I remember. Uh, so we sang the Messiah, we teamed up with Gresham School um, and sang at Norwich Cathedral. Um, a bit embarrassed to cook it all, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. um, but I did, and, and, and music was important to me then. 
Um, and again, largely due to, to take from. Yeah, you mentioned the fact you were sent away to prep school quite at a young age, etc., and then you went on to boarding school as well. Um, it has a tendency to make some people very independent. It's a sort of a make or break for some. Did it, did it make you, did it help in you? That's a really good question. I mean, for me, yes. I, I was eight when we got sent away. And I, I coped all right. I think as long as you were good at sport, you were sort of accepted. And so, I, so I, at eight, I went to Tavram, and then from then on, I went to Uppingham School, uh, which was nearer to home. But um, again, you didn't get home very much. Whereas my brother followed me, and he was two years behind me. And I think where my parents did make a mistake is they sort of put us together. I think Chris found it difficult to sort of follow somebody's slipstream, whereas he would have been better off, I think, being you know, independent entirely, starting afresh and not carrying all my baggage, <laughs> good or bad. Um, with him, so I think I had a happier experience than he did. But as long as you were, as long as you were good at sport, and after I was a fast bowler, and by the time I got to Uppingham, I was I was quite quick. So I could I could soon I, I always bore a bit of a grudge, so I could get people back <laughs> and teachers back in the staff match uh, if anyone sent me in detention. They, they soon learnt, you know, Agnew perhaps not for playing in the staff cricket match in the summer. You know, treat him lightly, or you'll get one round your nose. So um, I could always give it a bit back as a as a schoolboy cricketer. So you were always presumably on Leicester's radar at that stage as well? Well, funnily enough, I, I know I started at Surrey and my dad sent me as a birthday present to Alf Gover's Cricket School, which is down at Wandsworth, above a garage. And Alf was a kindly soul and he was a former uh, Surrey and, and uh, England fast bowler. And he immediately sent me to the Oval for some trials. I was 16. And um, I went and they said, yes, we want you to come and play for us. But then I'm a farmer's boy from, from Stamford what do you do? And again, um, how times had changed, but mum and dad took a very brave decision. Bear in mind that dad wouldn't be able to get to London, let alone find me somewhere to live as a 16 year old, but they, they found some digs for me down on the Northern Line with Mrs. Bushell. And I went and stayed with her for two summers um, as a 16 year old boy by myself, didn't know anybody. Um, and went to play for Surrey, which wasn't a great experience. It had, a, it had a, quite an unpleasant culture at that time. Um, this hardened old pros didn't want youngsters around challenging their positions, and I hated it, actually. Although Dad had been very brave. Uh, but again, I proved that I was all right. Like, I was good enough to play. But I went back to, went back to school, and the coach there was an old Leicestershire player. And so he said to Leicestershire, come and, come and get this fella. So actually, they signed me without having seen me, <laughs> seen me bowl. <laughs> Whenever Leicestershire came to watch me at school, it rained. And so I, I got signed that way. But... I won't look back at my time at Surrey with any fondness, no. And I'm not sure the culture's entirely gone. I think it has now. I think there was a period still until reasonably latterly where it wasn't a great place to play. Yeah, I imagine a very different atmosphere at Leicester. Well, it was. And uh, funny enough, you see, the captain at Leicestershire was Ray Illingworth, who I had spent years watching on my sofa at home. Um, and we talk about modern cricket and, and particularly terrestrial television and the impact that, that, that cricket not being on the telly has had. And I think it's been huge because actually... For me, sitting at home and, and watching Ray Lingworth and Jeff Boycott and all these people playing cricket, including Peter Lever, who was my hero, that, 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 that sparked my interest. And so I'd go off and try and be these people afterwards, Tony Gregg or Jeff Arnold or all these people. And so suddenly to turn up at Leicestershire, within a month of leaving school, they had an injury crisis. So I was in the first team, so I'd never met Ely before, but I'd seen him all these times on the telly. And I said, wow, you know, it was incredible. It, you know, what am I absolute heroes was now my captain and David Gower of course and so that's how it started and it, and it, and it was very friendly I, I wish to some extent I'd had the, not the support but the coaching and the the amazing systems that these modern cricketers have not in any way resentful but the, you know they have they are so well controlled from 15 16 everything set out for them how to train how to look after yourself I never had any of that and so having had 10 years at boarding school to suddenly discover life, you know, <sighs> I, I've probably wasted. You did two discover or three it, years. did you? Oh well, <laughs> yeah, well, I just, I just felt free. Yeah. And I went to Australia as an 18-year-old on a scholarship, which should have been fantastic. I lived with Mike, with um, with Frank Tyson, and I turned up really not knowing who he was. But um, you know, I lived at Frank Tyson's house, and I was more interested in just, I don't know, freedom. Really, I had gone straight from school, and I wish now I'd, that had been more strictly. Controlled. I think I would have. I think I'd have benefited from that. But yeah. it was not a great experience. Well, it's, it was, and, and you certainly <coughs> can't say that you didn't achieve because you went on to honours as far as Leicestershire was concerned, but also England. Yes, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll never play that down. I mean, I think people now 
um, you know, look at me as a broadcaster rather than a cricketer, if I'm honest, and that's, that's fine. I mean, I did play for England, yes, not very well. You've got to take a chance, and you're, you, you have you some luck. But in a tough era, it was a tough making, era. Making your debut against the West Indies. It wasn't, is, a, is, is it wasn't an easy first game. Right. It was the, the yes, the Blackwash Test match at the Oval, and so it was a bit tricky. Um, I, I don't know. In, in, in those days, you turned up the day before the game. I didn't know many of the people. Uh, I never met Ian Botham, for instance, who was like a central figure in the side. Although David was captain, but I didn't know many of my teammates, and I didn't even know I was playing until the next morning. And then suddenly there you are, you're giving your cap and off you go. So, yeah, it was, it was a bit strange. I mean, I look, at my, I look at my career averages and there's clearly a misprint in wisdom in that, in that my, my bowling average actually should be my batting average and my batting average actually should be my bowling average because they're <laughs> bowling average of 90 something. Um, but you, you have your chance in life yeah. and you either take it or you don't. And so as far as England was concerned, my chance came along and I didn't take it. And that's just an honest reflection. And I would say that of any cricketer who I'm talking about now who's played three tests and had my figures I might try and be kindly to them but I think I'd probably say perhaps he needs to go away and learn a bit more about his game and that would be my assessment of me at the time I was I was only 24 but um but you played for England it came I've got my cap absolutely it's, it's no there one, the, no there one can take that away from me which no. is fantastic you made the very brave decision in some respects of saying actually at a certain stage I'm going to turn my back on the game now when play you could have gone on for another few years quite easily um, and yet decided that, that radio was going to be the thing for you, broadcasting was going to be the thing for you. What was it? That oh, well, it, quite simply, because, it, because the winters as a professional cricketer in the 80s was, was a nightmare, unless you were a top player. Um, trying to find work for six months and then give that work up and go back to playing cricket was very hard. I mean, I worked in a window factory for a bit. I made some terrible windows. I mean, if anyone's <laughs> watching, so to replace the their window, window up. <laughs> Slightly drafty, I, mean, I can't put a shelf up. <laughs> Uh, that was terrible. Um, I drove a lorry uh, for an asbestos company for a winter or two, an old diesel thing. You had a mask um, on. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I did, actually. Um, so anything, anything to get work. And one day, John Rawling, who's a good friend of mine, who's, uh, well, you know him on, on, as a boxing commentator on, on ITV and so on, a bit, and a BBC in those days, athletics. He worked at Radio Leicester and came to me and said, why don't you come and work with me for a winter? He said, I think you'd really enjoy it. You'll get paid nothing. And I wasn't. Um, but I just think you'll, I think you'll like radio. So I went along, uh, and I thought it was fantastic. You know, getting up early, um, taking the news circuits, um, within any, you know, no time at Radio Le Leicester and local radio generally, you know, people move, or whatever, you're suddenly bang, 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 you're suddenly presenting a programme. Do you remember that first break? You got yes, everyone well has I remember that first Saturday morning, uh, and John was off somewhere, and suddenly I'm presenting the programme, giving this, you know, <laughs> this thing with all these faders and stuff records and I played I played a record in at the wrong speed Jerry Rafferty get it right next time I'll never forget it horrible <laughs> get it wrong. <laughs> I played it at 33 rather than 45 <laughs> that was terrible um, but you get your mistakes out of the way don't you and I just loved radio and I met I met my future wife there as well um, and so I discovered another life really and funnily enough my cricket actually improved a bit at the same time because I did discover there's a life outside cricket and I also worked for the Today newspaper, uh, which of course is now sadly defunct. But they were brilliant again in sending me off to go and cover all sorts of different sports, surfing, skiing, apart from the usual rugby, football, and uh, Aussie rules, uh, you name it. They sent me off to go and report on it, which is a brilliant experience. You know, I, I, I perhaps I'm a bit naughty on Monday mornings. I knew nothing about football particularly, so I'd read the Sunday newspapers and <laughs> cod, a, cod a few quotes, <laughs> get it into some bulk up the numbers. But it was the experience well, of having to find a story, really, and of having to survive journalistically without ever actually being trained to do it. Yeah. But that, that probably was the best training to do it. A national newspaper, a national tabloid newspaper, so a bit of pressure on. And, um, you know, get out there and do it. So I'll always be very grateful to, to the Today newspaper. At that stage, did you have in mind, listening to TMS as you were at that stage, uh, did you have in mind that one day, this is where I want to be? Was, it, was there already this career path in your mind? Well, the funny thing was that actually, when I was playing, I didn't listen to much TMS because we were playing. As simple as that. So, I mean, I listened to the radio a lot when I was a kid and on the farm with Dad, because he was a big TMS listener. So, John as an Arlott and, and, and Swanton's summary at the end and that sort of thing, were, were, you know, they were familiar voices. But actually, I think it helped that when I did turn up and I got this job, um, and having never commentated on anything before, and I turned up, reported for duty at Headingley in 1991, I think it helped in a way that I wasn't terribly nervous because I didn't really appreciate 
the history of the program, the tradition and the step that I was taking. And there were others who were a bit awestruck, who'd gone to the interview and thing. You, know, you could see they were very nervous. And I just sort of rocked up and had a chat and, um, and that was all it was. And it was rather like that on my first day. And I remember meeting Brian Johnston for the first time. He said, oh, you must be Aggers. And I would have been, I would have been Aggie up to that. But cricket a bit always called me Aggie, but suddenly it was Aggers. And that stuck. And there was with his cakes and I don't think he quite knew who I was to start with because um, I, I was sort of I was, I was expert summarizer. You know, I hadn't commentated, so so Peter Bax, the producer, thought he'd sort of break me in, sitting next to Brian. And since the other expert summarizers were Fred Truman and Trevor Bailey, I I, I just think Brian wasn't quite sure who I was or what I was doing there. Um, but it was oh, yeah, to sit beside him, who I think is just the most amazing broadcaster I've ever worked with, and I've worked with a lot now. Um, particularly radio, to get, to get communication, to get reaching out and touching people. Um, that's what radio is all about, and that's what I hope I've really sort of inherited from Brian. I still get some phone calls from his son, Barry, um, who will say, you know, you sounded just like Dad today. I think, OK, well, he was 50 years older than me, so I don't take that as a compliment or not. But, uh, but in, the, in the way of doing it, in the way of reaching out and touching people, because that's what radio is. Radio is company, all day in our case for people. Uh, it's an appointment to listen. You know, people know that at 10.30 or whatever it is, we're, yeah, we're going to be there and we're familiar. And that's what that year, particularly working alongside Brian, did for me. We had that leg over incident, which, um, <laughs> uh, you know, which sort of helped cement us as a bond. It meant that he refused to actually work with me again, apart, well, only fleetingly after that, because he knew we'd just laugh if we looked, we got eye contact. And yet it's still but, spoken about the same Oh, the Lego, the Lego was extraordinary. And, 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 um, I, and it was a bit tricky at the time because Jonathan didn't think it was funny at the time and he, he, he stormed off and thought that it was you know, appalling and let the side down and everything else um, and so it was my first year and I was a bit worried actually but um, you yeah, know it did it did it, it established me as being part of that team and frankly as for the reasons I've said about you know the soap opera side of it I think people on the radio particularly find it quite difficult to accept a new voice and CMJ Chris Monaghan Jenkins have been doing that job for so long that even um, sports bulletin presenters would say over to the ground and Crystal Martin Jenkins, you know, for a year or two, and it was me because they were just used to saying it. And similarly, listeners, I think, you know, well, who is this? Who is this youngster? You know, who, who is this man? You know, and you've got to earn your stripes. You've got to earn their trust. And so I think the leg over, um, which Brian, of course, came to love from the next morning onwards when I first played it to him, that played a huge part in in establishing me and I still play it and I tell all the story which is far too long really to go into now but uh, in, in a theatre with the lights off and that playing the laughter just resonates around it and and I'm, I'm very grateful to the leg over which wasn't my line but still it, it, it worked. The humour continues to this day and uh, whereas the sort of the leg over was then Today, perhaps people would say it's, it's the winding up of a certain Yorkshireman, which seems to be absolutely <laughs> captivating the audience. Because Geoffrey has spent much of his life being fairly, well, well being Marmite, shall we say. I mean, some people love him, some people hate him. And so I do think that, again, be because of radio and the programme and the way we've treated Geoffrey, I think people have actually seen a much softer side of Geoffrey Boycott that you, you wouldn't have seen before, actually. And I think you know, radio does do that to people. And I've always had a very good relationship with Geoffrey, even from, from playing against him. He was opening bats when I was opening bowler. I mean, he's, he's older than me. He's 20 years older than me. So he was, to be fair, waning when I played against him. But he was still the man to get out. You know, he was, he was, yeah, he, 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 he was the obstacle in your way. But that respect has lived on. And, and he, he, he will let me say anything to him, really. He, he, we've never had a crossword. Um, when he's been ill, it has been a couple of times, of course, you know, I've always been one of the few who he's wanted to come up and see him and spend some time with him and try and cheer him up. Yes, I'm a bit cruel to him, but I do know which buttons to press with Geoffrey. And so the one about his hundredth hundred, for instance, he's gone on and on about his hundredth hundred. <laughs> People say, how long did it take you to come up with this thing? It took five minutes, you know, <laughs> because like, there's nowhere to go with Geoffrey. And I, and I love it. And, and he enjoys it. I think he sees it as a way of, of, of him you know, being allowed to join in the humour of TMS without necessarily being humorous himself, because he's not, he's not really a humorous person. He's a very direct, brilliant, uh, you know, finger-on-the-button uh, critic, uh, the best I've come across at 
nailing a batsman's technique and their issues in a couple of sentences. And you immediately go, oh, yeah, of course, that, yeah, that's right, of course, Jeffrey, I see what you mean now. He's been the best at that. Never late, always disciplined. You know, Jeff Jeffrey has been an absolute dream to work with. He ruffles feathers, don't ever ask him about anything about politics or <laughs> anything remotely politically correct. <laughs> but then that's Jeffrey Boycott. Yeah. You talked about the humour, which underpins a lot of TMS, but there's also great poignancy most recently expressed in an email that was sent to you. Well, this was uh, remarkable, and well, on two fronts. A, because of the content of the email, but B, the impact that it had on people. And if I'm honest, I mean, my producer Adam gave me this email at the start of the day, said there's something that's come in, it's, it's extraordinary, you ought to read it. And it looked quite long, <laughs> and it was quite long. And I read the first paragraph to it, said, yeah, OK, and put it away. So I didn't read the whole thing, actually. Um, and then there was a break in play, and I thought, or rather waffle about the groundsman and his shovel or something. I said, remember this email. So I said to Adam, you know, let's have his email then. So he, he handed it to me and I just read it blind. And I'm glad I did because as it got on, I thought, whoa, where is this going? And of course, it was basically the story about a, a son and his father who had dementia, who was dying. Couldn't get through to him at all. He was in a little world of his own. He literally had given him a day or two to live. And so it was actually this fellow's wife said, put the cricket on, on the radio. And so he did. And within five minutes, this dying man with dementia was back in the room and the son had the chance to tell him how much he loved him and what he meant to him as a father. The father could say that he was, he was comfortable and he was relaxed and he was at peace with himself. And they listened to the cricket, England won and he died. Uh, you know, and it was, it was an incredible story and it sort of sparked a lot of things off, particularly about, about ways of prodding people back to life from dementia actually, be it through music, through sporting memories, uh, in, like that in this case. And it was very poignant, but again, it was, I think, a reminder of two things. First, of where Test Match Special goes, and it goes to uh, millions of people, and not just cricket lovers either. I mean, it, it, far and wide, and it, it, I say it, it is that companion um, during the day. Um, but just how, again, the effect that radio has, that a, a cricket commentary got through to a a dying man um, with, with dementia, uh, somehow the cricket commentary got through. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Over the years, you've also shared a, a lot of your thoughts and, and life stories as well, in particular um, with your wife Emma suffering from cancer. Yes. And obviously wonderful to see her recovery there as well. How difficult was that for you? How difficult a decision was that for you to say, actually, I do want to share this. I do think that there is some benefit to this. Well, that was, it was. I mean, it was her choice, really. Um, but we didn't have a lot of choice, I don't think, because, again, because of the way that the, the program is, if I'm not there for uh, some time, people are going to start asking why. And, and only kindly. Um, some might be saying good riddance, but, you know, people will be asking where it was. I just didn't think it fair on the producer to go in to make up a story or something. And so I said to Emma, you know, I think we should, what do you think? And she said, tell everybody, tell them. And yes, it was a bit of a risk, I suppose, because we didn't know what her prognosis was at the time. Um, but the support that we had, and, and I'm, I'm the first to whinge about social media when it's horrible. <laughs> and it, we've all been in the storm of Twitter storms and arguments and rows and stuff. Um, but the support that we had from people out there, people we will never meet and will never know, uh, was absolutely astonishing. And it did her so much good. Um, and so yeah, I just thank people all the time, you know, people do contact us, I mean it does make a huge difference and, and, and lots of people are trying to, to debunk cancer, I mean my parents when I was a kid wouldn't even have said the C word <laughs> you know, and, and now here we are talking about it openly, um, uh, dear Rachel had died recently again with someone who Emma knew very well and Well I wondered blogs. about that because of course that is a, a, another area, and, and, you know, another relationship and, and you talk sort of about family, the importance of family and you, yeah. you know very well now what's well, only to a degree. It's just awful. I mean, we all knew it. We did, we did a blog with Rachel, actually, and, and, and there's, there's, there's three of them. They're wonderful blogs to count. Yeah. Uh, You'll be in the big sea, Rachel yeah. Blant. And yeah. um, we, we did one in which she talked about actually the impact on the partner. And it was, it was very moving. I, I realised I was saying things on there and learning things from the others that I hadn't really, really established. But the bravery of her, in particular, um, really has caught people, I think. Um, and, and we're lucky, you know, Emma's okay, she's clear, thank God, uh, thanks to some brilliant people at Leicester and some luck and everything else, but then you can't help but put yourself in the other shoes at times. 
and uh, I was covering the Alistair Cook retirement story at the time. And I was a good, a good friend of mine, and I had a huge amount of respect for him. But I found myself paying tribute to somebody who has had a very charmed life, uh, who's done everything that was possible to do, and there we were almost speaking in terms of an obituary about, about this man, who, had, who was going on, striding into new areas of his life, at the same time that this poor family was, was torn apart. And I found that really difficult to deal with, actually. On the one hand, you, you, you know, talking in those sort of terms about a cricketer, um, while at the same time coming to terms with a, a young woman with a three-year-old child and a, and a husband who I know um, whose, whose life has been crushed. And it's, um, it's, it's where you have to remember, sport is sport. It plays an important part in people's lives, um, but is by no means the be-all and end-all, and, and people should remember that. Well, let's talk about sport. And your thoughts, I suppose, on, on, on where you see cricket is now and where it's going. And, and, and I, I suppose, how much do you worry about the future of cricket? Because from, from grassroots upwards, there, is, there are problems to solve, I would suggest, in, in many different ways. Yes, I mean, television's an issue. Uh, and I know I cover myself all these sort of initiatives from the ECB of how do we get this particular category of child playing, South Asian, Caribbean, or whatever it may be. And they are kind of divided up, which is a bit odd. But I can't help think of something, if you hadn't taken it off the telly, <laughs> this wouldn't have been an issue, you know, it'd still be there for people to watch. Well, and people didn't see Alistair Cook's test runs. No, I mean, or Jimmy Anderson taking all these wickets, you know, and that's, that's what it's all about. And Sky's done a lot of good for cricket, and I'm not going to go at Sky at all, and you know, their coverage of winter cricket has been extraordinary, you know, proper dedication, they put a lot of money into it. And I think England probably got to number one in the world when they did, because of the support that could be paid for from Sky's money, so that is an issue, so that's, you know, pay due respect to that, but I just wish they should have, they could have kept some sort of terrestrial element on. I really think they should have kept some sort of terrestrial element on. We wouldn't be where we are now with, with, with so few kids um, engaging in cricket, and that's, that, that's, that's a real problem. And um, you know, so instead of initiatives to, 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 to get them involved, um, they should be, be involved, and, and we should be using the access that we should be able to give them in, in different ways, and, I, and, and that, that does worry me. Um, the way that the game is structured at the moment. Um, I have real concerns about England winning away from home. I mean, ever, in a way, because we're not, pre we're not prepared for anything. We're not prepared for Australian conditions, South African conditions, Indian conditions, Sri Lankan conditions. You know, we, we might beat West Indies because they're rubbish. We might beat New Zealand because they're, they're similar to us, but in fact, they beat us last time. We're not helping ourselves. It's, it's very money driven, and again, I understand that's important. But actually, most important, I think, is the success and longevity of the game. Because without that, you can throw as much money as you like into T20 cricket or 100 ball cricket or whatever it is, because it's not going to be a game to worry about. You've got to get the basic right. You've got to get England winning, and you've got to get the platform for England winning in place. And, and without that, so you can toss your money all over the place, it's not going to achieve anything. There is this new tournament being set up. Uh, these eight teams, um, and I often use Worcester, Somerset, Gloucestershire, those sort of areas as examples of, of, of the challenge that the board has got. They, they, they're launching this new tournament that they think is going to save cricket with this audience that they claim exists, but, but where are they? And so it's going to be counties like that, supporters like that, or new people like that who are going to have to travel either to Birmingham to support a team that Actually, you know, they're, they're huge rivals with them. I mean, same with us as Leicester and Nottingham. We, we hate Nottinghamshire. You know, we hate their shops, we hate their football teams, we hate their, <laughs> we hate their rugby clubs. And it's the same down there, you know, they, all these rivalries. And so for me, the litmus test really of this new tournament, and I know, having been to, to that part of the world quite recently, a pretty strong feeling about it. Are they going to go into Cardiff to support a team that might have none of their players in it, or to Birmingham? So actually, that part of the world, I think, will have a big influence on whether or not this this sort of billion pound tournament of the ECBs actually works or not. Do you, do you ever sort of get the chance to walk around the field with a dog and, and reflect on what it's all been? Yes, I mean, it's, it's ups and downs really. I do, funny enough, I, I do struggle just to go and watch a game of cricket now. That's really weird. I mean, I have to work on it. It's, it's a job. It always has been from the age of 16 and those lessons with Alf Gover and those trials at Surrey. Um, so I'm very lucky to have had a life in cricket. But I've also, having been the player, you know, seen it from, from every aspect. And as a player, you, you do get a bit cynical about the, about the game. So I don't think commentators are often the right people to ask about 
about cricket because you're the ones there having to make a difficult game sing sometimes, 50 overs for instance. Um, however, you know, to have spent a lifetime travelling around um, and, and commentating on, on this particular programme has been extraordinary. I mean, I, the, the people that I interview on this programme, and that's one aspect, of, again, the TMS that I love, that Saturday lunchtime, where you're just throwing people uh, from all sorts of lives. I mean, presidents, prime ministers, actors, pop singers. Um, that I love. You know, it's a real challenge to talk to people about their, their love of the game. So I do. Uh, I, I, it, it always sounds very cliched to talk about you know, the best job in the world and all of that. And, and I don't know, I think if you're lucky in life and you do get a job that you like, there are lots of good jobs because it is only a job at the end of the day. And I do get a little bit narked when people just reckon that you just rock up and don't do any preparation or don't do any work. That's nonsense. You've got to work hard at this job. But having said that, um, to have spent the best part of 30 years doing it and to hopefully continue what Brian Johnston and John Arlott and these fellows all did well before me um, has, has been a, a, a real privilege. And we'll carry on for a few more years yet. Well, I'm hoping so. I mean, that I could do it. I mean, I've, I've been on call for 28, 30 years, which is, I, you know, I cover a lot of, oh, so I cover all the stories. Uh, and that's not always, you know, the, the funny thing about the job again is, is there's two sides to it. There's the sort of jokey, jovial commentator on Test Match Special. And then you've got the cricket correspondent saying perhaps the England captain should resign. And that for the first few years, again, um, people found that a bit hard to balance, um, especially after the leg over. You know, who's this man saying that Mike Atherton should resign because of dirt in the pocket? And so they, that was all quite hostile. I'm glad social media wasn't around then. Kevin Peterson stuff. Uh, that was very hostile, very unpleasant. Um, More recently, Ben Stokes as well. Well, indeed. And, 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 and so people do feel they can have a say now, and that's fine. But I, I still wish that there was a little bit of a limit where people accept that. You, know, you don't actually know what happened there. And whether you like it or not, actually, I do know what happened there. So just, you know, we can have a bit of banter about it. But, you know, I, I wouldn't argue with a heart surgeon about what he's saying is the best thing because he knows what he's talking about. So, you know, I do, it, it does go a bit too far sometimes. But, um, no, it's, 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 it, is a, it is a remarkable job. I've met some amazing people. Um, and particularly, as we said earlier, the, the people who helped Emma and me through last year has been almost entirely due to this job that I've had. And so for that, I'm, I'm really very grateful. Jonathan Agnew, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure.